Hey folks, this isn't a normal video. This is a non-monetized video where the comments are turned off because I wanted to talk with folks about the Dust Bowl and I can't do that without talking about domestic violence. So I wanted to warn you that that's going on. And if, you know, towards the end of the video, you want to reach out to me, don't worry. I'm comfortable talking about this stuff. I just wanted to take the urgency out of responding to comments. So feel free to email me. I'll talk to you all soon. We've got Texas coming up on Thursday. Folks, this is Emily. I want to talk with you about the Dust Bowl. Growing up with the stories I heard, I have this deep assumption that everyone knows about the Dust Bowl, but it turns out most people don't know about this piece of American history at all. It's a personal kind of story for me. The Dust Bowl was a pivotal event in my family history with, with generational impact, with echoing impact. I feel like it impacts me now knowing about the Dust Bowl. And let's start with the facts. Because it's easy to look at the weather news now and be like, like, but it could be way worse, you know, in many places it has been worse. And when we look at the high temperature records, when we look when they were set across the nation, you'll notice a lot of them were set at the same time in July of 1936. This is from the old farmer's almanac detailing a lot of information about the summer heat wave of 1936. Check out some of those records there. This was where for much of the nation, the peak impact of the Dust Bowl came. It was here in July of 36, a major heat dome set highs well over 110 across the Midwest. Steel, North Dakota recorded 121. The killing heat was well outside of the region too. It was 110 in Runyon, New Jersey on 112 in Martinsburg, West Virginia. So that's a big heat dome. Dakota's to New Jersey, it's huge. And this intense heat dome is widely thought to have been caused by the atmospheric conditions of the Dust Bowl. Scientists think that the soil blown up into the atmosphere contributed to those unequaled qualities in that heat dome. And I don't know if you can imagine how much soil we're talking about. You know, it's hard to photograph a disaster on the plains. Tornadoes are easy to photograph. They do dramatic damage in a small place. But a disaster that transforms the whole landscape, like a great blizzard, that's hard to photograph. There's no focal point. And that's the scale of disaster we're talking about in the wide area of the plains most directly impacted by the Dust Bowl. This is a map from Wikipedia showing the areas most impacted by the black blizzards. That's what they called them, where the topsoil was up so thick that visibility was as low as five feet from blowing black earth. My family wasn't in the worst of it. The branch I'll describe here, they were in Nebraska, and you can see that Nebraska had more moderate impacts, but the dust clouds blew all the way to Chicago. And these dust clouds, they were the ruined topsoil, the ruined generational lifeway and wealth of the lands we now call Oklahoma, Texas, and Arkansas. Right in that circle there, right in this circle you see here, that was where the sustenance of generations lifted off the ground and blew into the lungs of America. It was squeaking against people's teeth. And from what I learned as a young child, conditions were still really bad, even if you were a bit outside of the immediate black blizzard circle. And maybe you can imagine better if you hear it like I did. If you hear it like you're very small, you know, imagine you're listening while you're looking at what you'll later learn are salt shakers. And you're just wondering what those pretty things are. And you're hearing this from a voice that's always very gentle, much more gentle than me. That was the voice of my great grandmother. It's always a very soft and gentle voice. And that's how I heard these stories. My great grandmother, she took care of me a fair bit when I was very young. I was a colic baby. I'm told no one else could comfort me the first several months of my life. She died when I was five years old. So this is all very early childhood memory stuff. I can still remember the feeling of her hands and the quality of light in her kitchen and the sound of my horrible great-grandfather always berating her in the background. My great-grandmother, she was very beautiful. She had very delicate bones. Her family was poor. She grew up poor in a sod house and she married what you might call up. I was always taught as a girl, you know, it's as easy to love a rich man as a poor man. That's the line they tell you when they dress you up and tell you to behave. But I had my great grandmother's life before me. And I saw that man treat her like he bought her and he beat her. And I saw her die of cancer. Well, he berated her about the chores he that she hadn't done and that she should get up and change the TV channel for him. And that he had already asked her twice. I'll never forget it. And, and many of us, many of us here on the channel, you know what it's like to be taught one thing, but see another 
and be the kind of person you can't be corrected out of trusting your own eyes. So I never wanted to marry a rich man. My great grandmother, she would tell me about the dust while she cleaned. She was always cleaning. She kept an immaculate house. And she would tell me, quiet and gentle, that the dust would come up under the windowsill, that the dust would come in through the tiniest cracks in the walls, that if she sat down to rest, little drifts of dust would build up. If she fell asleep when she woke up, it would be as if she had never cleaned at all. That the dust got into the cabinets, that got into the dishes and the linens, the dust got in the water. There was no way to wash anything clean. You would just wash and wash. There would be a fine gray powder on everything. You could taste it in the food. It would squeak against your teeth. I hope you can gather this story, the dynamic. It was evident to me as a little child that the dust bowl getting inside the house was entirely my great grandmother's fault. Now that I'm grown, I feel such great compassion for that woman in my heart. You all must know there are problems bigger than we can control. Many of us will experience tragedy in the years to come, tragedy related to environmental disaster. It's not your fault if you can't keep the dust out of the house. This is a good place to study up. You know, land use practices cause the dust bowl. This wasn't exactly a natural disaster. It was an environmental disaster, and it could happen again. In the dust bowl, we saw some years of drought causing landscape change, and that came together with uncovered soil, soil that had been raked by the plow, and they used to say rain follows the plow. The 1920s were a very wet decade in the plains, and that was seen as a benediction. Sometimes there's just variation rather than benediction, though, or even consequence. There's a human tendency to read variation as punishment or reward. That's useful in a narration, but it's not real. But if we're reading for narrative, in this case, I would read that variation, that wetness following the plow is more of a setup. My great-grandmother, who was such a beauty, she grew up in a sod house there in Nebraska. And the pictures of these old sods, like you can see here, you can see they were thick like bricks, the sods. Now a thick sod is even an inch of sod. And on my land in the last five growing seasons, we've managed to lay down nearly an additional quarter inch of sod. And you can roll it like a rope and it feels just wonderful in the hand. It's a, an abundant richness feeling in the hand. And that was the richness of the life that we destroyed was life that had such thick sods, only the steel plow could expose the soil. They say that the flocks of goldfinches then were like a colored banner in the sky. After the Dust Bowl, farming practices changed. We put cover on the soil. In areas that were hit hard, there are intense regulations around soil cover to these days. This is a threat that we fight here on the plains. We fight and we've been winning and that's why so many people have forgotten that this threat exists. You can see here some information shared on social media, how corporate farms, which maximize profit at all costs, have been tearing out the natural infrastructure, the green infrastructure that prevents dust bowls. They've been tearing out windbreaks, tearing out what we need to fight this ever-present threat of a dust bowl. And we are starting to see the dust rise again, as you see in this still right here. If we engage in responsible land use with sustainable irrigation, which is not the same as profit-driven irrigation, it seems very likely that we could continue to prevent the black blizzards from coming again, but the area at risk for soil loss is going to be increasing right now at this time when corporate farms are tearing out what we need to prevent another disaster. Let's take a look. Let's look. Where is there the potential for aridity, where it's going to be hotter and drier? I'm looking at our AR resource that Dustin put together showing the total increase in days over 95 at 1.5 C, which is where we are now in 2 C. And you can see that wherever you are in the U.S., it's getting hotter. If you're in these green areas, it might only be a couple more days over 95 in a year. Or if you're down in the south of Texas, you could be talking about a 90-day type hot season increase. Really wild. But wherever you are, it's going to be getting a little hotter. So the big question is, where is it also getting drier? 
we can get a good idea of where that drought trend is going to be coming as we move towards 2C in figure 4.3 from the NCA5. So these areas where we see a drought trend here are areas where we could have a new threat emerge. A new threat that I bet most people don't consider, even who are currently working in climate, because the Dust Bowl doesn't have as good a place in our national memory as we need it to. And we never saw this kind of threat emerge out of some of these places before. I want to point out that even in the wettest projections, we see a potential hotspot in Oregon. Look, driest, wettest, average hotspot for aridification in Oregon. We also see hotspots emerging both consensus and even in the wettest conditions in parts of North California and the Central Valley. Anyone who's driven through it can imagine, could easily visualize cataclysmic soil loss in the Central Valley of California based on the current farming practices. We don't know that many other people have been thinking much about this building soil loss threat in ways that are public facing connected to climate change. If you're a soil scientist or a land use manager or a land steward who's protesting at me on the other side of the screen, then of course you've thought about this threat. I want to show you with this Yale resource, which will also be in the video description, that you're not alone in thinking about it. We're not alone in considering this. Some other people have started talking about this threat in a public facing way. Not surprisingly to me, it is another Iowan. It is an Iowan who's a research scientist who is really behind that push in the climate world. Just spreading an increasing threat of increasing aridity, of increasing risk for desertification in the midst of immense landscape change is why we need to remember the Dust Bowl. The lessons we learned from the Dust Bowl, they seem like they work. We've had some generational practice now, and these, they seem like functional solutions to keep cover on the soil. Nurturing the prairie, helping to restore the prairie, that would be a powerful way to keep cover on the soil, particularly in the abandoned croplands over the Agoala, where people have taken what they can get and cleared out of there. That's where we need drylands prairie restoration the most. Prairie is cover that can connect with the groundwater, that can create a cycle of wealth in the soil. That wealth that we squandered with the steel plow and the land that we then abused it could heal if we take steps to help it heal. And this is what we need to do. We need to keep cover on the soil, engage in sustainable irrigation practices, ones that don't drive down the groundwater, but try to help even out the crazier weather of our times by giving some water to the land in extended dry seasons. The impacts of these simple things would have impacts far beyond the local level. They would have impacts across the country. These actions will help prevent heat domes, like we saw in 1936, that could kill people. These actions will help prevent long-term agricultural disruptions, and these actions would protect habitat and living things. But here's the thing is people aren't gonna wanna do all this stuff. You know, farmers will do, um, people who are attached to the land take a lot of soil care precautions, most of them. But the big corporate operations that are currently tearing out windbreaks, they control a lot of land. And you have to understand these changes in practice aren't profitable. You got to think more than a quarter out to see why we need these practices. But it's still people behind those decisions. This is all just people and human actions. And some people, they need the socks scared off of them before they can do the right thing. But maybe you don't have to feel that fear yourself. Maybe you can imagine my great-grandmother cleaning that dust 50 years later with a special quality of fear. There's a special fear that you can only know when you have a monster who lives in your home. There's a special fear in those conditions when the worst thing you can imagine is outside the house. And if it will benefit you, let me give you that fear as a gift. We're gonna need courage to implement these changes, even on our own land use practices, because it's so much more profitable to mistreat the land and to overdraw the water. But this, the basic care for the soil, it could prevent another dust bowl or even more horrifyingly dust bowls. This is care that can help preserve life. The soil is our great storehouse of life. And to do what we can to protect the soil, it's a noble thing no matter what comes next. There are ways we can look at what's coming 
Sometimes it helps to look backwards and to see through another's eyes. Thank you for sharing this time with me. Let's get ready. Folks, thanks for watching and for spending some time with me thinking and feeling about this environmental disaster. When we learn about the Dust Bowl just through what we can quantify, I think we can sometimes miss the emotional impact, the way these environmental disasters impact people's lives and, and their generational impact. That's what motivates me to act personally, is the feelings, if I'm going to be honest, more than the numbers. I want to express my gratitude to you all in the AR community. I'm very grateful to our donors, to our volunteers, to everyone spreading the word online, and especially to everyone doing the work on the ground. It's something different for me to share a story like this. If you have something you want to say about it, please feel free to email me at ar at americanresiliency.org. Thanks, and talk to you again soon.